So again, this is going to be the introduction to digital signal processing. Uh, key thing on it is, you know, definitely the actual reliability uh, of digital systems. So we'll get into some uh, basics of it, uh, as well as some functionality that does encompass DSP, uh, you know, in a basic scenario looking at it. So what we'll all cover today is what is DSP, Digital Signal Processing, what is it used for and why is it desirable, how is it applied and when, and what do your products uh, employ DSP. So what is DSP? Again, I'll say Digital Signal Processing, that's pretty basic. But it refers to various techniques for improving accuracy and reliability of digital communications. Uh, the theory behind DSP is quite complex. Basically, DSP works by clarifying or standardizing the level or states of digital audio. So DSP can be a standalone unit, a standalone box, or it can be, and more commonly these days, integrated into digital mixers and amplifiers. Even very simple single zone, you know, maybe three or four input mixers, are moving over to uh, DSP functionality for a, a variety of reasons, which we'll get into. What they do is they've got to convert analog inputs because we're usually dealing with analog inputs, so microphones, music sources. Um, but sometimes it is fully digital. We were dealing with digital music sources uh, and signal that way. Uh, and then eventually we're going back from digital, from analog to digital, and digital back at the analog when we get into the speaker side of things. So it's usually going from that analog to digital and digital to analog. Um, so look at, again, uh, digital signal, uh, waveform, how it's kind of changed from analog to digital, which is a key uh, point to understand when looking at DSPs. So that's usually the weak point of a digital signal processing is that analog to digital and digital analog conversion. All communication circuits contain some noise. Uh, this is true whether signals are analog or digital in regards to the type of information that is conveyed. Uh, digital signal processing dramatically improves the sensitivity of the receiving equipment. The effect is most noticeable when noise competes with a desired signal. So a good DSP circuit can sometimes seem like an electronic miracle worker, keeping things nice and quiet. Again, when I talk about DSP, and as we get in the next slides, we're looking at sampling rates and so on, that's generally uh, a weak point of DSP when you look at dollar value from you know, low, mid to high is your analog to digital and digital analog converters. They are not all created equal, and there is uh, different chips that are more inexpensive. The ones that are, you know, cost a little bit more when designing a piece of equipment, which can definitely add to the sound quality or degrade it, depending on whether it's a low quality device. So something to be aware of. So starting off the very basics. Uh, of digital signal processing, we have an analog sine wave, very simple. You know, your positive wave, your negative wave. Uh, so that's on the analog side, and eventually we've got to digitize that. So we look at uh, analog signal sliced into discrete sections. So that's your sampling rate. So that's where the digital chip is looking at that analog wave coming in and taking slices of it and reading that signal. So that is your sampling rate, each one of these bars. These uh, sections are given a value at the sample points. So you've got your sample rate, and then you get your various sample points. Uh, the word size is expressed in bits, 8 bits or 16 bits, 24 bits. The higher bits, the more precise that that uh, sampling, that converter would be. And true, it's going to be to that analog signal. The result is a digital impression of an analog wave. So again, you've got your analog wave up here. And we've got our sample rate and the sample points and how many points that we take along that, uh, that travel. Uh, and then we have a digitized signal. You know, this is very chunky looking, uh, just to give you uh, the understanding of how those steps are. But again, the higher the sample rate and more sample points, the smoother this conversion becomes. So the higher quality DSP will have a smoother conversion uh, from that analog wave uh, to the digital side as well as on the output side from the digital output to an analog output. So the process within a DSP unit to the analog outputs feeding maybe amplifiers or again, it may be on the output of the amplifiers feeding into speakers. So 
So uh, looking at the digital impressions, they're expressing numbers at each one of these uh, sample points, which are in turn converted uh, into binary numbers. So a little techy there, but that's kind of the, the conversion that does take uh, place from that uh, analog to, to digital conversion. So some of that kind of part, and again, there's uh, going through that chain, we've got an analog signal, that microphone, that music source uh, going into a system, uh, conventional analog domain with an analog to digital converter, you have your DSP, which will get into all the functions and features that that can do, and then on the output, goes back into the analog side of things. So digital signal processing, why is DSP desirable? So advantage of DSP, uh, cost versus application. There are a lot of things built in the DSP that's going to make the installation a lot easier and quicker. Uh, improve signal to noise ratio as all functions are contained in one product. So what that means is that uh, in the older type of system where we didn't have as much DSP, you might have uh, a mixer and then an EQ and then a compressor and, and various, uh, various boxes that were all connected together to do various functions. Every time you're going in and out of a system, there's a chance of noise being added to that system and being incurred. Uh, so because it's all done in one box, you reduce that noise floor because you're not going in and out, in and out in connections and so on. So your signal noise ratio is improved. Uh, seamless integration of many functions uh, to make life easier, reduces labor uh, as fewer connection points are required. Automation can happen because uh, various platforms like an AMX or Crestron or Control 4 can control uh, a lot of DSP products and control them in a way that they choose. Can program via computer, so settings are saved. So once you configure a system, you know, you have those settings saved for some reason, you know, that unit goes down, gets damaged, maybe there's a water leak and something happens to the gear. Uh, it's easy to get the, the system up and running again because you've got that software and configuration saved and load that to a new unit and you're up and going again. So uh, that does save a, a lot, as well as remote uh, integration. So again, if it's in a remote location and something needs to be changed on the system, some kind of functionality, you know, as long as you have net, uh, you know, access to that DSP through a network and the, the internet, then you can potentially log in there and do some modification remotely. So you don't have to wait uh, for potentially a service person from the integrator to come up and visit you, especially if you know, it could be five, six, seven, ten hours away or a lot more. So it's easier to uh, get the system up and running and service it, uh, being that it is digital. Uh, so again, new policies of technology are leveraged, and we'll get into some of those key things. Uh, depending who's all on this conversation, maybe some in end users on this webinar today, integrators, engineers. Uh, one thing I do see and it's important uh, to look at in the system is that all the DSP functions that are available are being utilized. Sometimes I do walk into facilities uh, that are planned with a certain issue, and I you know connect to that DSP, and I find that there there may be things like compressors, limiters, gates that are not fully configured. So it's really important on the commission side to utilize them, as well as the technicians out there to to understand the various functions that are built in that DSP. So DSP so. Again, the, the best possible outcome and performance in that system will be realized. Because there are a lot of uh, very simple, easy settings that can make usability a lot easier than uh, if they weren't configured. So we'll talk about those as we move forward. But definitely pay attention to all that the various DSPs do have to offer. Okay, so how do DSP apply? So we're going to look at various DSP functions and typical okay. audio products. Is there other products that are out there? The most common is, is what we'll have a look at. Uh, they may look different, but basically they all have the same signal flow and function. So I'll do a couple screenshots of some of our DSPs and how we kind of go into the unit and out of the unit. So in this particular kind of flow chart of one of our digital mixers, on the left we have our inputs. So again, input one, two, three, on through to 12. And for this scenario, we'll say these are analog. So the, these picture inputs will go into uh, module cards in this unit. You have your trim, which is your gain control. Then we get into high pass filters and EQ. 
Uh, again, all these points we'll kind of talk about as we move forward, but these are all the different sections of the DSP that should be con uh, configured. We've got compression in there, a potential for auto mix. We have a fader control to do the comparison between various inputs, so the music may be a little bit lower than a microphone, that type of thing, so you have fader control. Also, in the DSP, you'll generally have a matrixing functionality to say, I want certain outputs to inputs go to certain outputs. So if you look at, let's say, input one on this chain going all the way over, we'll see that input one is highlighted to go to output one. And input one is also going to output four. Uh, that's part of the matrixing. So I can make any input go to any output in a configuration. Uh, so that's so that's the big uh, plus on DSP is being able to have that contoured state of certain inputs to outputs. Again, fader control as well, filtering on the output, compression and or limiting, as well as delays. And then we end up going on the output of that back into either, uh, in this case, would be to an amplifier with your feed speakers. So this is all, these are all separate functions that should be configured in a DSP. This is a Remy 864, another screenshot, a little bit newer DSP, same type of flow, inputs on the left-hand side. Uh, we have pads, and that's kind of a, a drop-down case of signal too hot. Uh, we have gain control, we can see the meter in the signal, we see that the meter is, or the signal is present. Fader control, tone, uh, some other functionalities, feedback suppression. So again, when microphone gets a little bit closer to uh, to closer speaker, I could squeal. Uh, DSP functions feedback suppression to take care of that and auto automatically notch out those troublesome frequencies. Matrix section, PEQs on the output. Uh, acoustic resonance control, which is an auto room EQ, which I'll talk about in a bit. Again, fader, metering, attenuation. So we've got here, we've got eight inputs, additional two stereo, which are going to feed into the matrix and on the output, four zones on the, on the output. So look at how it applies some key things uh, within the DSP. Uh, so, you know, you've got filters uh, on your inputs, and usually you'll have this on the input and output side, where in this case we're looking at a high-pass filter. So basically what a high-pass filter is, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to let everything above a certain frequency, in this case 500 hertz, let's use our 500 hertz, pass through, and then I'm going to roll off everything below that. So first the thing is to pick up one filter you want. Again, in this case, it is I high pass field, but pick your frequency, and we'll go to some other settings beyond that. Actually, this one does right. So in this case, you get the 500 hertz, and then you've got your gain of where you, you could potentially boost that up, and then this one doesn't have Q, but we'll get in the Q in the next one, which is how wide of control you want. So generally on, on a, a basic high pass filter, it's a certain slope, so you'll have different variations of this dB behind, which is your D deviation and reduction from that uh, on the low frequency. So it's allowing the high frequency through and dropping off the low frequency. Other parameter uh, parameters that we can set up again in this particular case we're looking at a frequency of let's say 1k so we want to on a PEQ side which is parametric equalization gives us a lot of control on certain frequencies throughout the range of hearing so from 20 hertz on your left to 20k on your right and again you get your zero dB mount uh, point location point so that's as the signal is coming in. And then above it is your plus dB and your minus dB. So this is adding those frequencies or taking those way, away those frequencies. So usually you, have, you can have multiple filters on this, depending on the DSP. You know, some can be limited to three, some could be 20, some could be infinite. So that's how many different of these filters you can add to a PEQ. So in this example, uh, for whatever reason it may be, we want to add some little bit of intelligibility. We're picking one kilohertz. So we're selecting that in our menu. And then we're adding gain, we want to boost that 12 dB. So that 12 dB is we're taking that 1K, we're boosting it up to 12. The next setting in there is our Q. Q is basically the width of this increase or decrease. So the higher the Q, the wider this, this would be, this curve. 
And then there it basically, and then the opposite is if you want it really fine, which would be a, a notch filter, which I'll show you in a second. Those are normally fine in your high pass and PEQs on the input side and on the output side. So that's going to help you, you know, add a little bit more bass to the system if you want, uh, intelligibility, maybe roll off some low frequencies. Again, if, uh, if you're looking, I'll go back a couple of slides. On this particular scenario, if the room is very boomy per se and we don't need a lot of bass and it's only for speech, then maybe we'll roll off that low frequency because it's not required. The opposite may be true. Maybe there's too much high frequency in the room. We can do do the same on that side of things uh, to play with the sound in that particular room. So again, just reiterating how this this works. So there's your again, this is a high pass filter uh, uh, based on 12 dB. You get your 100 hertz is what we're playing with. So that shows you this point, and then you're changing your Q, which is, again, how this this range works and how it's affecting how the width of what uh, what control you want on that frequency. So here we're doing kind of a, a band pass type of scenario. We've got a high pass and a low pass filter. So we've got two filter points. One here is a high pass and right here is a low pass. So in the combination of those, would be, you know, at around this 10K point, we're rolling off the high frequencies. So maybe we're getting into some feedback scenarios within a room, uh, a little bit very hot in the higher frequencies. Again, up in this range, you know, 20K is the highest you're getting here uh, in the frequency range. So there's not much is coming through on that side through, you know, human speech. So we can roll off uh, that high frequency. Maybe it's to get a little rid of a little bit of noise going through the system that may be present. And cut that off. And on the low frequency side, again, we're picking in around uh, 75 hertz and then we're rolling off the low there. So again, when someone's speaking, they're not hanging down around 75 to 20 hertz, so there's no need for that to be there, so we roll that off. And between those two points, we're staying pretty much flat in that area. So look at the various filters. You know, there's high pass filters again, low pass filters, paramatic uh, EQ. So that's the most common that you're going to see in DSPs. So again, we'll look at uh, this particular first, it's kind of hard, a little bit small, but this first little shot here. And we're about 1K here. And we've got a Q of 4. So as we reduce that Q over here, we see the same 1K and widen that out. Uh, so that's a 0.7 of a Q. So that's your difference of wadding the frequencies uh, below and above that center frequency that you're going to adjust as, as you increase that uh, gain level. So we're picking our 1K, a gain of 6, and then a gain of 6 on both these. But the only difference is our Q level. We've got a Q of 4.3, and we've got a Q of 0.73. So again, the lower the Q, the wider she goes. And again, it could be cutting out troublesome frequencies down here. Uh, we're 200 hertz here, and we've got negative 12 gain on a Q of 4. So, again, we're taking away a frequency that may be troublesome within uh, a system. And this is just illustrating that you can have multiple different points within a PEQ. So, you could have a low pass filter uh, and then a high pass filter. So, there's your high pass, there's your low pass, and then various other PEQs. A lot of TUA speakers, uh, depending on how, how they're, they're used, will have a PEQ and a manual for them. So basically, you can take that PEQ, it'll tell you, uh, you know, whether it's a PEQ, high pass filter, low pass filter, the frequency, the gain, and the Q, and you plot those into the DSP, uh, which will add for intelligibility, or maybe it's used for music or with without a sub. So you can add those directly to the DSP. In addition, a lot of the newer units that TOA does have released has pre-configured plots uh, for PEQs built in. So instead of having to manually enter all these points, you just pick, I'm using an F122 or an H65 line array, and it'll load in the PEQ for that speaker automatically. Again, so that makes it a lot uh, quicker and easier when configuring a system or ensuring that the system is, uh, you know, 
up to its optimization of sound quality because again those PQs are a click away from being loaded for the intended purpose. Another filter is a notch filter. So it's a very narrow cut filter, uh, not affecting a wide range of frequencies to the left to the right of it. Uh, and uses the high gain cut only. Where these uh, are primarily used is maybe, you know, you're stuck with uh, a, a, an audio AC feed that has six cycle hum in it, or you can reduce that uh, and, and pick a certain frequency and drop it out. A lot of times it's used for feedback frequencies within a room that maybe doesn't have the acoustic treatment that it should control, and we have some troubles in frequencies that tend to, to run away on us. So you can, uh, you know, via real-time analyzer, analyze what those frequencies are and drop them out. And this is how to, how uh, DSP, as I mentioned earlier, a functionality of a feedback suppressor works. If it notices, in this case, uh, 1.5K is, you know, creating feedback, then it'll just pick as narrow as it can with its Q value and drop that frequency right out. Once it notices that that frequency is no longer a problem, no longer an issue, maybe it's where a presenter is walking with a microphone uh, in proximity to that speaker, and that's no longer an issue, then it'll take away this, this notch filter automatically. So it's very intuitive and keeps functioning and reading the system. Also related to EQ, uh, PEQs and EQs is crossovers. Um, so that's just uh, the relation between your high frequency and your low frequency within a system. And within all TOA speakers, it'll get you that crossover point that we suggest. So again, you're picking a frequency. If this is a subwoofer of you know 40 hertz and a Q factor of where we want to roll off. So where we want to say, um, you know, the mid to high speaker, let's say it's an HX5. Having an HX5 on its own, you know, sounds really great. Adding a subwoofer is going to extend the low frequency to it. So when you do extend that low frequency, there's no sense of the speakers of the HX5s trying to do bass when you add an FB120, which does bass. So you pick that frequency area, whether it's 100 hertz or 80 hertz, depending what that speaker is. And you say, okay, I'm going to roll you off. So I'm going to set up a high pass filter uh, that anything above 80 hertz is going to go through the HX7. I'm going to roll off uh, anything below that. You kind of do the opposite to the, to the subwoofer. I'm going to say subwoofer, anything above 80 or 100 hertz, I'm going to roll off. There's no, a subwoofer doesn't do a good job of doing high frequency. So no sense of having it try to do so. So you set up an output uh, and a crossword point to say, okay, Low frequency speaker, you're just doing 80 hertz uh, approximately below, and mid to high speaker, you're doing 80 hertz and above. So the DSP will allow you to set those crossover points within the system. And looking at that filtering here, here's kind of the example here. We've got some uh, a little bit of boost on the low frequency here in around 40 hertz and then we're rolling off below that and pretty much flat beyond that up and above there so and then we've got a peq uh, for the speaker here that's a little bit of boost uh, at around 5k uh, on that side of things so that's a relationship depending on the speaker uh, it'll provide again the peq that it suggests that you add into that so this is examples for the fb120 and an hx7 Other functionality built in the DSP is open delays. So this is something that commonly I find is not configured properly, and it is very, very simple to configure. So the example of what an output delay is, is if you look at, let's look at a uh, house of worship, a church. Uh, so we've got maybe 20, 30 rows of seating. So generally we may have speakers at the very front, uh, up by the podium type of idea, and because of the size and, and the depth and length uh, of that uh, that facility, house of worship, we might have some speakers at the rear to fill in the rear. Because again, we don't want to try to have you know the speakers in the front uh, reach the rear if it's going to overpower the people sitting in the front. So we need a combination of front speakers and rear speakers. Uh, so that'll help with the volume levels 
But if you don't have a delay present uh, in the DSP or it's not configured, uh, we're going to create a very, per se, reverberant and unintelligible space. And the reason that is, is if you're sitting at the rear of that room, you're going to get sound instantaneous when someone speaks from the speakers that are closest to you. So the speakers that are in the rear for the rear fills, and you're maybe five feet in front of them, you're going to hear that sound immediately. Then uh, you're going to hear the sound and the delayed sound of the front speakers hitting you. So you're going to get a, an effect of hello, hello, welcome, welcome. That kind of almost reverberation sound, but it's not being created by the room. It's being created in the delay of speakers over distance. So therefore, the sound of the, the speakers in the rear actually need to be delayed. So they need to be delayed so they only output when the sound from the front speakers reach you. So that, that output is pretty simple in our DSPs. Uh, you know, you can measure, do some math and measure uh, the milliseconds delay, but most of our DSPs will have a distance. So in this case, we're looking at an output maybe your left and right up front, and then it got a distance of 30 meters and 34 meters and 40 meters. So these are your speakers basically up front. And as you go to the rear of this room, they're your delayed outputs. So you just have to use, you know, again, a, a measuring tape or digital measuring device and measure the distance from the front speakers to each speaker going back in that room. And then enter that distance in your delay option. It's just simple. That's going to clean up your audio uh, tremendously. So it's something that a lot of times is, is an oversight. Maybe it's not configured or on the commissioning side and looking at a, a system may not be utilized. Pressures and limiters or levelers. Everybody's had the scenario of someone speaking in a public event. Uh, and maybe someone that's a little bit shy in the microphone, they're either quite quiet and timid speaking, and then there's someone that's very calm and, and boisterous and very loud speaking. So you have a variety of dynamics from speaker A to speaker B. Sometimes just a music source, uh, going into uh, a gym system at a YMCA or the input at your local hockey rink, and music sources from phone outputs, MP3 outputs, or the quality of that music source, they're not all at the same audio level. So again, you'll have song A, which is quite loud, and song B, which is quite quiet. So that can all be addressed on the compressor <laughs> or leveler side of things. Um, so that uh, that's a setting built into it. Sometimes they, they give you a lot of control on that. Uh, your target DB, your max gain, attack, release. Sometimes it's just a, a, a five-step uh, description of whether it's speech, microphone, or music. And what it will do is it will basically set up an output based upon uses the quieter signal, and then in the beyond that, it will basically compress and drop down. So you'll always get that constant output depending on what that audio signal is going on the input or that person that is speaking. And again, that's key if it's house of worship, anywhere with using a microphone, to have that compressor uh, connected or and not connected, but engaging and figured, so you have that auto leveling going through. So that's something that is often a complaint, and it's built right into a DSP, and may or may not be configured. And again, it's something that uh, when you're designing for some that you, you want to. Um, just want to mention uh, again, if anybody's joined recently, if you could please mute your microphone. I hear a couple people that have uh, have a microphone open, so if you could make sure that you're muted, that'd be much appreciated. Next slide. So the matrix slide of things. Uh, one thing I'm not sure, uh, actually I'll wait till the end that uh, I'm not sure it was mentioned is a leveling side of the compressor, but I'll wait till the end and see if uh, that slide comes up. So the matrix uh, section, the matrix uh, sits in the middle of the processor. So again, I should have a picture of a DSP and we're going from left to right. <coughs> so we're kind of in the middle side of things. We've handled all the inputs. We've got Game, we've got PEQs, high pass filters, crossovers, that type of thing, compressors. Now we have to say, signal, I want you to go where? So, generally, analog uh, outputs sometimes, or, or mixers would have a couple outputs, uh, but it wasn't easy to configure 
uh, inputs and outputs on the fly. The matrix side of, D uh, of DSPs make that very easy. Um, so basically, it's saying of the inputs available, and it may be a smaller unit that has eight, it may be a larger <laughs> unit that has 32 or beyond that on the input side, and where do you want that input to be sent to? And that's your output. And those outputs could be on a simple four output design, like an MA64, that could be gym A, gym B, cafeteria uh, and stage, or it could be hotel lobby, banquet room A, banquet room B, and uh, restaurant. So it could be a variety of outputs in those areas. So you can select, again, what input you want to go to those outputs. So maybe you, on your input side, one and two. One might be a mic, two might be a music source, and I want uh, them to go to output one. Uh, on this kind of scenario, we've got input one going to output one. We've got input two going to output two. Input three going, uh, sorry, to output two. Uh, and input four going to output two, or uh, one and two. So it would be any combination that you can select of those inputs to outputs. You could have them go to all outputs if you wish. It all depends on the functionality. Uh, but the one feature that uh, the mace will allow you to do is create different scenes, uh, as we refer to them, is this may be scenario scene A, but there may be scene two where the inputs and outputs and where they are fed change. So as a basic example, I'll use a multi-purpose room in a hotel. You might have uh, you know, a large banquet room that has a dividing wall. So scene A may be input one and two going to you know, side A. It could be input three and four going to side B. That's one scene. Scene two could be input one, two, three, for going to output A and B. So again, that's when the room opens up. So you want all those inputs to be available to all the outputs. So there's various scenes that you may require. Maybe it's a school gym that separates and divides and things like that. So they're, you know, having the DSP to allow that functionality is, is nice. Additional functionality built in a certain DSP. Um, one function we have in the TOA side of things is, is ARC, which is acoustic resident control. So it's a system that we, we uh, TOA has devised. It's available built into our MA64D, our M633D, and our DPK1. So what this does is basically a microphone is, uh, is placed in the room and it analyzes the room acoustics. Uh, by the single push of a button. So it sends a variety of test tones out and reads the audio coming back uh, via reverberation, reflections from that room, and then will automatically EQ certain nodes or frequencies that are, you know, mudding up the sound uh, and reducing intelligibility. So, you know, with a push of a button in a room that maybe doesn't have acoustic treatment and very reverberant, uh, will really clean up the intelligibility and increase uh, clarity within the system. So, that's a big advantage to DSP is having things like that auto EQ built into the system. Some other functionalities built into it. Uh, we do have uh, serial line arrays. So it's a, a DSP function in our SRD8s. Uh, that's built in. So beam steering accomplished by delaying multiple speakers in that array of speakers. Uh, basic control where the sound is dispersed. So that's a whole webinar on its own in serial line arrays, but basically you can control whether the sound is spread out very far to the back or really down front close. So DSP will allow and basically allow you to aim the coverage of a certain speaker in a space. So where that comes into play is maybe based on design of the room or maybe one application might be an old house of worship that you're kind of stuck putting the speakers and location A and B, because aesthetically you can't move it elsewhere. Maybe it's asbestos issues and that to have to go in an area. And the place of that is not really the best for speaker coverage. Uh, some DSP out there uh, that will allow you to adjust the dispersion of that speaker based upon a DSP that's built into it. So that's a nice some, some functionalities of DSP to uh, help offer coverage within a space.
So going through um, some DSP products from TOA, and we started releasing DSP products in 1980. So a lot of our products do have a variety of functionalities built into it. So we've got our 9000 DSP uh, mixer. So that's an eight input, eight output DSP mixer with compression, PEQs, matrix, and outputs built into it. We have our M864D which is a 12 by four DSP. Uh, that's got arc built into it. It's got feedback suppression built into it. Uh, one other thing that isn't mentioned in this presentation when you get, get in DSP, it's more functionality and flexibility on the control of the system. So the M864D uh, does, you, does allow iPad control. So examples of school gyms that have a stage, it's phenomenal to be able to control and, and adjust microphones by walking out in the audience and say, okay, I can't hear uh, Sue's vocals or Bob, will you speak? And I can easily turn that up on an iPad app. So it allows you to have control of the system remotely in a space uh, while you can hear it. You know, adjusting sound levels, you know, on a mixer that's up on the stage in a school gym is kind of hard because you can't hear what's coming through the speakers. So allowing you to easily get out in front of the speakers and adjust the system is nice. So that's something that, again, is, is a, a function of a DSP system or a mixer. Uh, the M863D, uh, again, from kind of a scaled down version of M864 that does have feedback suppression, acoustic resonance control, and analog control in the front, uh, but a full DSP background. Then we get into the D901, uh, the D2000, when we get up to 128 inputs and outputs. We do have separate speaker control processes that handle your delays. So in a large arenas or large house of warships where we have multiple speakers in various delay points from the center of the ice going right back to the, you know, the end uh, and, and side of the rink behind the net, that's the thing. They all need delay and processing. So you have standalone higher end units to handle that. Uh, another DSP function that wasn't mentioned but I'll quickly touch upon is ambient noise control. An ambient noise control is available in a separate DSP device, which is the DPL2. It's also available in a module form that will go into our 9000 series. And what excuse me, that DSP function does is that it allows you to add a microphone in a space. Uh, example, let's say a bus depot. Uh, and mit, or let's use a, a factory, a bottling factory. And uh, what it will do is it'll measure ambient noise within a space. So as that ambient noise goes up or down, it'll adjust the output to the amplifier. So maybe you know a, a certain production line is working at a certain you know you know two production lines are working in the day, so it's a lot of noisy environment. So we need more output uh, to go above that ambient noise. So maybe on the nighttime shift, it's down to you know one line or half a line, so it's not nearly as loud. So that way the system's not overdriving and too loud. Uh, it reduces the output in those areas. Same as in hospitality as well, too. You know, in restaurants and so on, it'll do the same thing, where it'll ramp up the audio output up or down, depending on the ambient noise level. So that's another function of DSP, depending uh, on what you need to look at. So there is a full variety within the line uh, to, to create a lot of, pro or, or offer solutions to a lot of everyday problems that you have uh, in in a situation, whether it's auto leveling of microphone and volume control or different you know, loud music, music feedback control, uh, to that makes uh, you know, the system form on its own a lot easier. Some other DSP uh, we get into is, you know, uh, with our mass notification product is, you know, digital uh, voice recording functionality for digital messaging, maybe something that you want for evacuation. We also have built-in DSP that will allow you just to do basic announcements or pre-recorded messages. Maybe it's Canada at the beginning of the school day. That uh, is something that can be built into a DSP. Uh, on the evacuation side with our BM3000 mass notification uh, unit, it may be uh, monitoring of speaker lines to, to make sure they're connected and functioning right or self-analyzation of the amplifiers to make sure that they're functioning, the state of the unit is up and, and, and uh, function the way it should. And if it's not, to notify you. So there are some 
self-monitoring DSC functions that uh, may be required and are available within certain product lines.